This month, I read every single chapter of Chainsaw Man, and today I am delivering my final thoughts on this series through my coverage of the final three arcs. To tell you the truth, when I first started this series three weeks ago, I truly did not know what to expect. There was hype surrounding it for sure, but there have been plenty of those in the past that never really floated my boat, which is a nightmare when you're a review channel. With that said, this story was different. Where I've struggled to keep reading in the past with other series, Chainsaw Man offered fascination and clever twists. Where other series have been let down by clunky paneling, this one soared higher than very few I've ever seen come before. I've made a habit of comparing this manga and its production to many others across this series, but to tell you the truth, while standing on the shoulders of those that have come before it, Chainsaw Man manages to innovate and create, for me, an adventure and experience that's unlike anything I've seen before. To say that I'm excited for the anime to drop later this year would be the understatement of a lifetime, and here's why. This is my review of the harrowing, unrestrained, and blood-curdling disaster piece penned by none other than Tatsuki Fujimoto. This, my friends, is Chainsaw Man. Oops. International Assassin's Arc. Before I started this series, I said to myself that I'd make four videos. However, I am now glad that last week I decided to make just one more. Because of the last three arcs that remain, this next one, it might be the one I enjoyed the least in this series. This isn't to say, of course, it didn't have some brilliant moments, some great story development, and some super popular car. Poor kid. It absolutely has all of those things with plenty of implications for the future that help to drive the next and final two arcs into the stratosphere. So why didn't this arc work for me as well as it might have done for any of you guys watching? Well, from chatting with one of my editors who loves this arc, they told me that not only is this held in massively high regard amongst the fanbase, but was in fact a period of the story that really grabbed a lot of readers' attention. And I can see why. The format itself is very simple, following the now famous Chainsaw Man as the agency he works for is tasked with protecting him from the newly introduced assassins from the different corners of the globe. I like the idea behind this personally, as it does have a lot of upsides. It helps to broaden the scope and the implications of the plot to a global level. It helps build Build up the world more and as I mentioned it's simple which is honestly kind of nice however it's with that last aspect of the story that I noticed my first and honestly most pressing issue arose the arc itself spans across two full volumes making it one of the longer arcs of the series of those two volumes I really enjoyed the second one or the second half of the story it's where the vast majority of the plot happens and develops however within the first half I felt as though the pacing of the story screeched to a halt the premise of an international effort to assassinate the chainsaw Man is a compelling one and on its face a seemingly fun story to follow. However, in exchange for that clear and concise format we're all too familiar with, the story itself loses a lot of the spontaneity that I've loved about the Chainsaw Man series since I began reading it. It sets up a number of different families, agencies, and mercenaries for hire from different countries, all vying for Denji's heart. This is interesting and carries with it a lot of expository heavy lifting. However, in exchange, this means that the narrative also becomes rather predictable and bogged down during this section by having to tell us who these people are and why they are the way that they are and their motivations etc which in any other story would be perfectly reasonable i've just gotten used to chainsaw man leveraging the reader's expectations more to deliver surprise after surprise and this one just felt very uh, I wouldn't say boring, but it did feel a lot more safe by comparison. My favorite part of Chainsaw Man has always been getting to spend time with the central cast. Power, Aki, Denji, Makima, and even some of the other secondary characters are very well established, and tons of the hijinks and humor stems from their interactions and misadventures within the ordinary and the extraordinary. However, in the first half of this arc, it felt as though they played significantly smaller roles, all in an effort to facilitate the exposition for characters that ultimately die in this very arc. With all of that said, however, once that half was completed and the pieces finally started to fall into place, I felt my interest in reading this picked back up tenfold, with the midpoint twist acting as the catalyst for all of this specifically. When I read that conversation between Kanshi and Kishibe and saw that Kishibe really didn't trust Makima, I knew we were in for something special and oh boy, were we. 
Turning the weirdness dial up to 11, Chainsaw Man once again reached its stride, hurling Denji and the gang into literal hell. During this section, you could really tell that Fujimoto was making a concerted effort to illustrate and convey the horror elements of this story wherever he could. And not just through traditional avenues like monsters, but through existential dread. He really comes across like a student of horror in this section as a result. Introducing us to the primal fear devils through the darkness devil himself was a fascinating, visually surprising, and gruesome experience. With that shot of the astronaut sliced in half and lined up being a hauntingly grotesque yet beautiful reminder of how damn talented this manga cut truly is. The descent into hell was one of the most surreal feelings of powerlessness this series has ever forced me to contend with. Watching on as all of the people we've grown close to over the last number of arcs are tortured and mutilated to terrifying degrees made for some of the most compelling reading I've enjoyed in a while and that's not even to make mention of Makima's involvement. She is not only a powerful devil, it seems as though that she is the devil to look out for in this story. And I didn't even notice this the first time I read it, but another wonderful Easter egg my editor pointed out to me after I finished the story came from that very torture scene, where all of their limbs are disconnected from their body, so to speak. The limbs themselves spell out something. Bakima. How fucking cool is that? The action and combat scenarios in this arc are quite different too, with the newly introduced assassins acting as an elegant vehicle to facilitate unusual encounters. The brothers from the USA created a momentary dissension amidst the group, not to mention the power of the bodyguards at Denji's disposal, which come into prominence in later arcs. The Santa Claus dude created effectively an army of zombie dolls out of the citizens in the area, another brilliantly horrific visual that leverages the strengths of the genre. And of course, the giant demon doll girl. There's a tremendous level of progression in this arc second half, teaching us tons about the world, why all the devils have a fascination with the chainsaw devil himself, and perhaps where this story might be going in the not so distant future. Looking at this arc from an analytical perspective was interesting. I wondered if perhaps the weekly nature these chapters were released and digested helped to add intrigue and encourage the building of the story. I wondered if the arc felt like a natural jumping on point for a lot of new readers, thus expanding the community immensely. Regardless, I think you'll all agree that the way I first read through this story was quite different to how many of you longtime fans of the series did, and I think therein lies my personal problem and our difference perhaps. Where you guys were allowed to bond and turn the car into a meme, when my editor asked me about it, I legitimately didn't remember the car at all because I had already finished the series. I suppose it goes to show that the manner with which you view or read something very much colors your perspective on it later. But in a nutshell, I have described this story in the past as one that's driven heavily by its central cast of characters, and when they take a backseat to this degree, particularly in the first half, it felt that little bit less like Chainsaw Man to me while I was reading. Overall, however, when I take everything about this arc into consideration, there's still a ton to enjoy, particularly in its second half, with Halloween, Makima, Halloween, The Darkness Devil, Santa Claus, and Halloween, 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 Halloween. 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 Did you know that the car I didn't even remember managed to rank higher than Kobani in the popularity polls? I'm actually serious. Halloween. The Gun Devil Arc. The final two arcs of Chainsaw Man are, in my view, the strongest of the series and as close as this series gets to perfect. As many of you I'm sure are aware at this point, I'm very much the type of person that values the journey far more than the destination itself. However, even I will admit that it seems to be easier to write some brilliant stuff early on when you don't have any restraints compared to tying those various plot points together at the end. When your story needs to meet its resolution in a satisfying manner, the merits and cohesion of your story is laid to bear. And if things don't work, then those plot threads snap. And to see that, you need look no further than HBO's Game of Thrones as an example of such a catastrophe. As soon as the showrunners were required to write their own material to bring everything together, without the proper time, care, and understanding of what ought to be done with these established characters, the show, to put it politely, imploded on itself, leaving the vast majority of fans feeling empty. This is all to say that when your character-driven story has clearly been building up to something significant, for it not only to live up to those expectations it's set for itself, but to over-deliver is indeed a rare outcome for sure. Something I personally worry about tremendously for the likes of One Piece, but one I can say, Chainsaw Man delivers on in spades. Kicking things off, I really enjoyed this chapter entitled 
bath. These are the chapters that Chainsaw Man does best in my opinion, and ironically, it's not really to do with the intimate nature of the events that take place within them, but instead what sort of introspection that stems from those intimate scenes. Across this whole story, Denji has, in an effort to achieve his dreams and live the most fulfilling life possible, actually started to show signs that he's growing as a person. He's making the less desirable choices when faced with dilemmas because they are the compassionate thing to do and in doing so manages to highlight for us the good he can potentially bring to the world, and how these actions can help even the most reprehensible or selfish of individuals to grow and mature as people. In the first couple of arcs, Denji felt like a child, someone that didn't know what intimacy was or why he was feeling a particular way about anything. However, now he's able to make inferences based on his understanding of the world and his past relationships. He's able to understand that his platonic feelings towards power are more closely akin to an older brother instead, helping her to deal with trauma she's experiencing following the climax of the previous arc with the Darkness Devil. Similarly, Aki, someone who I had characterized as being the polar opposite of Denji in that he didn't care if he led a fulfilling life as long as he killed the Gun Devil, has transformed into someone that wishes to withdraw both himself and his division from this mission. Because now, he feels like his life has meaning beyond that mission. He has something to lose now, something he values. He has a family. If the last arc delivered anything that was worthwhile, it was the beginning of this arc proper. Following that all too close brush with death, being faced with utter darkness forevermore, it seems the three main characters in this story have grown tremendously from it despite their scars. And to back up for a second, this arc is remarkably short given the title, The Gun Devil Arc. However, the title itself is in effect a misdirection as the main driving force behind the story is anchored by the fondness and closeness the group of Aki, Denji and Power grow to feel for one another and how that is stressed and strained by the true subject of this story. When confronted by Makima about his desire to withdraw himself as well as Denji and Power from consideration, Aki's life comes crashing down far beyond what he thought was even possible as Makima manipulates him with ease into rejoining by leveraging her control over both Power and Denji in the Gun Devil assignment. With Aki's only recourse available to him being to beg Makima for mercy and to give her anything she wants to assure her that Denji and Power will be safe. And this is where the story goes fucking crazy in the best of ways. Makima reveals that the Gun Devil is neutralized and that the main objective now is to seize control over as much of the remaining parts of said devil to assure Japan's safety into the future. With that sort of acting as a metaphor for the nuclear deterrent in accordance with mutually assured destruction. And that's what this story has been about ever since the beginning. Manipulation and control. Fitting as Makima is the control devil. And therefore the greatest threat to global security, leading the US to launch the gun devil into action, killing as many people as they deem reasonable to get to Makima. It's funny that the extreme means with which the USA elected to launch an attack on Makima and Japan indirectly fuels the very control Makima has over people. With her leveraging the prior attacks to manipulate Aki and help her to legitimize the agency she fights for in the first place, the circumstances are necessarily circular, which is honestly the most unsettling part of this entire story. With paranoia being the order of the day, one cannot exist without the other, each one fueling the supposed justifications they have to attack which brings us to the conclusion of this arc. And as I mentioned, it's a short story, but it packs one hell of a strong gut punch at the end. There's so much achieved in such a short amount of time in this arc, all the while leaving space for one of the most beautifully handled battles I've ever seen committed to the pages of any shonen. And I mean that. Prior to this attack's launch, when consulted, the future devil reveals to Aki that Denji will in fact slaughter both he and power. And due to this, Aki was willing to do anything in his power to survive and protect both of them, even give himself to Makima. But Makima has other plans resulting in... This is comfortably one of the top three moments of the series for me and might even be my favorite. And the manner with which it's depicted is not only novel, but harrowing to sit and read through. Earlier in the story, the future devil promised us that Aki would die in the most horrible of ways imaginable. 
A death so bad that even the future devil himself wanted a front row seat to see it. And in much the same way a story promises you a satisfying conclusion, this claim promised us a worthwhile end for Aki's character and it didn't disappoint. Having become a gun fiend, Aki, entranced, returns to his home where Denji and Power lie in wait, fearful of what lay behind that door. The fight that ensues contrasts tenderly and fiercely in equal measure with the last moment in Aki's life he was truly happy. His present happiness violently clashes with his past happiness, manifesting this horrid delusion that forces him to attack the people he's given everything to protect. But I think what made this fight all the more special to me was its conclusion. Denji forced to kill his best friend, someone who was like an older brother to him while he, Aki, or what's left of his consciousness, understands the interaction to be a childhood snowball fight. The very snowball fight that he never got to experience or share with his brother prior to the gun devil's last attack, symbolizing at least in this one perfect moment that Aki very much saw Denji as a brother too and that could fill the void that traumatic event left in. It's only nine chapters long, but this Gun Devil arc was nothing short of spectacular to read through and one of the shining achievements of this wonderful series. Control Devil Arc in an interview conducted in 2017, Fujimoto himself said this about Korean films that I think signaled exactly what he chose to do with the Chainsaw Man story. He said, I've always wanted to write a manga that's like a Korean movie. There's this movie called The Chaser where the main character chases after the villain, but 30 minutes into the movie, he catches him. This is supposed to happen at the end of the movie, so you keep wondering what will happen next. A lot of people say that in Korean movies, they can't tell what the director is thinking, but actually, if you watch until the very end, you'll get it. The main plot of this story we've been led to believe was the pursuit and termination of the quote, gun devil. And just as we're heading into what we feel should be the climax, Fujimoto had the gall to title that last arc, the gun devil arc, and then switch the antagonistic target of the series on us in the last seconds. And it works so damn well. Following those events for the first time in Denji's life, he's grieving and he doesn't understand these feelings at all. From the beginning of this series, he's undergone a significant and rather nuanced change with his maturity and outlook on life, wherein the more he understands and contends with, the more his world expands, the more nuanced each encounter becomes, and therefore, the more consideration and mental anguish he has to agonize over. We've watched him change from someone that honestly didn't know if he cared at all about humanity, to someone that found a dream he thought was worth fighting for, all the way to the man that wanted to do anything but pull the trigger, or in this case, red the chainsaw to achieve that dream. He was never a monster, a devil, or anything so uncaring towards humans. He was just a lost boy that grew up without someone to guide him. And so now he's having a full-blown existential crisis. In other words, we've seen Denji develop and grow as a character. The boy that would eat literal vomit now can't even stomach a fresh treat due to the grief he feels. These are all super interesting and new developments in this story for the young character, and just as he's trying to process these feelings, Fujimoto brings the story back to the oppressive formula that's unconsciously dragged Denji down this path of sorrow and destruction. He brings Makima back into the picture. And true to form, she brings him home to her place, gets him integrated, and boom. She says that he's earned his reward. The reward that carried with it an uncompromisingly heavy price, and instead of what he initially thought he wanted, once again, Denji reverts back to being a child. He doesn't want all of this responsibility and maturity, because it can be difficult, sometimes too difficult. And so to alleviate himself of that difficulty, he gives himself up to Makima. And throughout this tale, also, while Aki and Power were strong forces that helped to socialize and mature Denji effectively, Makima, around every turn, has thrown roadblock after roadblock in front of his development, forcing Denji to make choices that he otherwise wouldn't have made without being pushed in said direction. This has been the through line or main narrative thread that spanned across this entire story, Denji's grappling with doing the right thing. This is the single most screwed up thing I think this already messed up manga forces me to sit and watch. After relinquishing himself to Makima, she invites over power and... Bang. 
And it's here we see the consequences of such action. No matter how badly Denji might wish for this to be a dream or for himself to stop thinking, he can't. This is real, and these are the consequences he's brought unto himself. The image of this door has been ominously looming over the series, whether it be via dreams, visual manifestations, or indeed, the deaths of his two best friends. Both doors that opened and either directly or indirectly, he caused. He can't stop fighting. He can't surrender control. He has the power to change things, and every second he doesn't, he's making a mistake. The final battle is paced extremely well with the major set pieces spread out perfectly to help hold audiences attentions. It's strange but the way Chainsaw Man is illustrated and laid out it almost feels like a storyboard for a film sometimes, particularly during action sequences. I haven't read Dragon Ball Super in a while but something I didn't like about it once upon a time was how much the action in the action manga felt like filler. And due to that I think Chainsaw Man feels at least on some level like a modern critique of shonen action manga. Within each fight of this series, fighting doesn't just happen for the sake of ending an arc or a conflict. Fights occur in the story when they have to happen, when they believably should occur. And this is the most important part. Once they do occur, they service the story being told in fascinating ways. The story doesn't just stop to show the fight, it continues because of it. Scenes like Denji slicing through hell, Makima afterwards, his pit stop at Kobani's family restaurant, and days with Kobani are all very different ingredients that go into making this wonderful meal of a fight seem for us to enjoy. Also on a visual front, this is some really smooth, interesting paneling and artwork. There are some really sweet page spreads atop rooftops, with some really satisfying perspective shots as we zoom in and zoom out of the action. However, at this point I will say that I wasn't in love with the way power exited the story. It felt rather, I don't know, unceremonious, particularly compared to Aki. That was until Fujimoto decided to surprise me by having the little blood of powers in Denji's system act as a means for her to come back momentarily. She literally explodes forth from Denji's collapsed body, screeching about being the first president and that Makima is trash. First of all, based. Secondly, I'm really happy that the harrowing but short scene where power was taken from Denji wasn't power's last hurrah. She is one of the most overly dramatic, dynamic, abrasive and funny characters in the series and for her to go out following an arc where she became a shadow of herself would have been, I mean, alright I guess, but I love that Fujimoto chose to do this instead. Choosing not to end power's stint in the series with a demure whimper, but instead an appropriately powerful, chaotic and defiant final battle cry that managed to shift the podium in favour of Denji, if not only for a moment. She's been an active character from the very beginning of the story, and despite her having grown tremendously since the introduction, she's still capable of extraordinary feats that catch even the despicable Makima off guard. There's tremendous amounts of back and forth that take place in this final section and while I've been reading online some folks found that it was a little rushed, I can't say that I agree. Or at least not in the same way that perhaps many of you might be feeling. In a 2017 interview talking when questioned about what he thought of the theme of revenge, Fujimoto had this to say. I think what matters most in revenge is how it ends and also what the main character will do once his revenge is accomplished. Denji, by the time this story ends, has been manipulated and controlled by Makima into killing two of the people closest to him in the world, Power and Aki. And you'd think the most interesting part of this story would have been the final battle between he and Makima, to liberate the world from her looming presence and, and while this might not necessarily have a lot to do with revenge specifically, I think the focus that Fujimoto places on what happens afterwards to the character speaks a lot about this particular quote, as I think it's wonderfully true to the character and direction that Denji's been heading. Chainsaw Man is and always has been a story about where one finds the resolve and meaning in life to push onwards. From a troubled child that struggled to survive alongside Pochita, to one that felt obligated to define his own dream, ending with a snapshot of a much more mature character having gained enough experience to not act irrationally when faced with someone that could potentially do tremendous harm in the future. After Denji's final takeout of Makima was accomplished, he didn't let his memory or experience of her control him beyond the grave, instead choosing to see the little girl for what she is, someone in need of guidance and help. And overall, I think Chainsaw Man, if nothing else, should be remembered for its commitment to stay true to these characters that, in my opinion, greater than the gore 
world, visuals, or weirdness made this manga a more than worthwhile read on a number of levels. Many stories often, if allowed enough time, fail to deliver and ground their characters in believable ways. I mentioned Game of Thrones earlier, and Daenerys Targaryen fits that feeling unfortunately. While the destination she ultimately lands on isn't unreasonable to think for her character to land on eventually, with enough time and care, the writers of that particular show instead rushed the development of that character for no other reason than their wanting to end the show there and then. Fujimoto, on the other hand, had delivered the exact opposite of this by conceiving of and delivering upon the conclusions for all of the main characters in this story that believably brought them a full circle conclusion and in doing so managed to serve the story greatly. The fashion with which Aki finally makes a contract is the logical conclusion of all the events that took place since he was introduced. Power started as an uncaring sociopath, convinced that she had no one in this world that she could love, and ultimately managed to believably sacrifice herself for Denji, the person that she does love. Earlier in this video, I mentioned that Chainsaw Man, in many ways, is a modern critique of older action shonen tropes, and nowhere is that more obviously seen than through the character of Denji and his development. As a main character, he doesn't yearn to be the best devil hunter there ever was, like the way Luffy wants to be the Pirate King and many others might in different shows. Instead, he's a regular, albeit impoverished young man that just wants to lead the best life he can. An intentionally ambiguous goal, the definition of which changes as Denji does throughout this story. And that's sort of the point. Chainsaw Man is a manga that I not only recommend, but encourage all who even show a passing interest in Japanese storytelling, be it through anime or manga, to pick up and try for themselves. It's easily one of the most consistently exciting and thrilling reads I've ever had the opportunity to sit down and enjoy, and I cannot wait to see what the anime has in store for us later this year, and what part two has in store this summer. Next week, my team is taking a much needed break. I might still drop something myself, but if I do, it'll probably be something a little weird, so prepare yourselves for that. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. Pick up your Chainsaw Man inspired merch through the link in the description, and thank you all so much for watching.